Good morning, church. Today's scripture is Luke chapter 12, verses 13 through 21. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who made you the judge and arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them a parable, saying, The land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, What shall I do? For I, excuse me, I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grains and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. All right. Thank you, Caitlin. Good morning. In Randy Alcorn's book, The Treasure Principle, he tells a story about a man named William Borden who lived between 1887 and 1913. Borden was a Yale graduate, so he was sharp, and he was a man of great privilege. He was born into a family of incredible wealth, and he had a huge inheritance he was looking forward to and had a big part of. And yet, shortly after he graduated from Yale, so an Ivy League school, he traveled to Egypt, and God developed a heart for people specifically in the Middle East, and specifically people from a Muslim background. And so Borden chose to invest his life, his time, and his finances in sharing the gospel and participating in the advancement of the gospel. And Gordon, after only being in Egypt for about four years, tragically became ill and died. And he was buried in Egypt. And Alcorn, the author of this book, shares a story about when he and his family went to Egypt and they saw this man's grave, and it was in an obscure place, kind of off the side of the road, and they had to dust off his gravestone. And on the gravestone, it said, apart from faith in Christ, there is no explanation for such a life. William Borden, in his short life, gave away hundreds of thousands of dollars toward the advancement of the gospel. And many would think his life was a tragedy, maybe even a waste. Now, not too far from this obscure gravesite, there's another gravesite that's not so obscure. In fact, it's a monument. It's massive. People come from all over the world to see the tomb of King Tut, King Tutankhamun, in Egypt, was also buried. He also died young, but about 3,000 or so years before this, he died. He was referred to as the boy king of Egypt. And King Tut, when he died, he and many others believe you could take with you what you got on this earth. So he died in a gold casket. And if that isn't enough, that gold casket was in another gold casket and another and another. And then just for good measure, next to this, these caskets was a solid gold chariot. And then that was all put in a gold tomb, which was in another gold tomb and another gold tomb, right? Like nesting dolls, but not something you can use your hands in. Entire tombs, massive And 
it lay untouched for about 3,000 years until 1922. It was discovered and then again turned into a monument and a museum and a place where people come from all over the world to see this incredible wealth. And again, remember that in William Borden's, on his tombstone, it said, apart from faith in Christ, this makes no sense. So this morning and over the next four weeks, we're going to kind of pull back the curtains and look at our relationship with money and earthly possessions. So I just want to ask you, out of the gates right now, what is your relationship with money? What is your relationship with possessions? You might be thinking, I, uh, I came to church, <laughs> and uh, here we are. Well, out of the gates, we say we, uh, we don't beat around the bush. We will take comfort in knowing we're going to be uncomfortable together. In fact, let me just zoom out at what we're going to look at throughout this entire year, right? This next four weeks, we're talking about our relationship with money. The, the overarching title is Richness Toward God. And uh, hopefully you were here l- last week. I know not all of us were here last week on uh, January 1st, but hopefully even for those of us who were here, and if not, I encourage you to go back and listen. We walked through what we do every Sunday. We explained every part of our service, and I even honestly myself, during the call to worship, I was in a different place, having reflected on what we talked about last week and the significance of all the different parts of our Service. So that was great. Thank you for those who kind of participated in shaping that. So again, now we're looking at our relationship with money and earthly possessions. And then uh, over the next uh, number of weeks after that, we'll be in Isaiah looking at, at, at suffering. And then we'll have Easter. And then we're going to talk about sex and sexuality. And then we're going to talk about one of the just easiest books in the Bible, the book of... Revelation. So uh, nothing, you know, we just, we stick to fluffy, easy subjects here. But, but here's why. Okay, I just want to, again, just acknowledge, hopefully, again, if you've been here for a while, this isn't anything new. But we, we believe in that we are called to disciple and to grow as disciples. That means followers of Jesus. We say all of life is all for Jesus and, and every aspect of life it needs to come under the light of who he is and what he says it looks like to find the fullness and richness of life in following him. And as we sometimes share here, we are discipled all throughout the week in so many different settings. We are, we are told we can find life, value, hope, security, richness, fulfillment in so many different areas. And so we want to specifically bring our relationship with finances under the light of the good news of Jesus, to bring that before his throne. In fact, Jesus himself says, where your treasure is, there your heart is. What you value, what you treasure. Now, I just want to even say on that, when we talk about consumerism, for example, we are tempted to think, I'm not consumeristic, I don't have much. Well, I can say this, that... no. Consumerism is, is the accumulation or the desire to accumulate the goods and experiences. So it's not just, you know, all my stuff, all my cars. We might think, you know, I don't have a car. I have a fixed gear bike or an e-bike or whatever it is. Or I, you know, I wear one pair of clothes all week. But again, we all want to consume something, whether it's our wardrobe or our Instagram number of followers and our travel log, whatever it is, right? We all want to consume. So, and also this is about every single one of us in our relationship with wealth, with finances, with goods and experiences. And I know people who have a lot of money and have a great relationship with finances. It's in a great place. It is in a great perspective. And I also know people, I grew up in a pretty poor family, and I will tell you that just because someone grows up in a, someone doesn't have much does not mean they have a great relationship with money. Okay, you can be the most money 
hungry, if you will, when you don't have it. And so I also know people who grew up with very little and currently have very little, but have an incredibly generous posture and perspective. And then the opposite is true. Those who have a lot can also be very stingy. So that, that's it. we're all under the light here. So uh, again, as we go into this time together, I, I want us to pray. And, and I want to just out of the gate share my kind of big idea this morning is this, is that greed leads to death and disappointment. But generosity brings richness and life. Okay, so with that, let's pray together as we enter into this one passage of scripture. We're going to be in Luke chapter 12. Throughout the next four weeks, we'll be in the same chapter, chapter 12, verses 13 through 48. This morning, we'll be in verses 13 through 21. And so before I pray, let me introduce myself. My name is Dave. I'm the lead pastor here. As you can tell, probably over the last few minutes, I stutter, kind of comes in and out. As I go, it's not just because of the, the subject matter. So um, I want to just again give you a heads up on that. And go ahead and turn with me in your Bibles. Again, we'll be in this same book of the Bible for the next few weeks. So if you have a copy of God's word with you, turn there. If not, will you hold your hand up high and keep it up? Okay, we want to get you one. We want to make sure everyone has a Bible to follow along with. We have some. Just keep your hand up. This isn't an auction or whatever. Keep it up high. We'll get you a Bible. Y en español, si quiere la... Biblia y no tiene, por favor, levanta su mano y diga español. Y si no tiene una Biblia, uh, eso es un regalo a usted. Y esta mañana estamos en el libro de Lucas, capítulo 12. So again, we're in Luke chapter 12. If you don't own our Bible, this is our gift to you. See, we're generous. You're welcome. Let's, <laughs> let's pray. Father... Thank you for this morning. Thank you for this group of people who are in here. Thank you for warmth. Uh, last week we were not warm in this uh, in this in this auditorium, and this week we are. And that's a small reminder of um, ways we think we're in control. We take I take so many things for granted until they're taken away, or I don't have them. I presume that life will go the way I think it should go because of certain things I've done, and, and yet I'm reminded that's just not the way it is. So Lord, this morning as we come into a subject that affects all of our lives, money, finances, it in and of itself is not necessarily evil. It's actually your idea. But the love of it, the, 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 the enslavement to it can be the root of all kinds of evil. And uh, it leads to destruction and disappointment. So Lord, I pray that you speak to us. I pray and trust that you will do a work in here that will shape us to be a holy, set-apart people. Lord, I confess that in my own heart, in my own life, and in many cases, the life of our church, we can blend right in. And sometimes that's good. We can reflect our surrounding our cultural context that we're in in ways that are good and we can celebrate lord when it comes to finances and money and anxiety about it or or the or the short term perspective of 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 where hope and joy and fulfillment can be found sometimes we blend right in so lord i pray that you will convict us where we need convicting you will encourage us where we need encouragement lord i pray that uh, your word will bring about a good work. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Turn with me to Luke chapter 12, verses in verse 13. We'll kick it right off here together. Someone in the crowd said to him, that's Jesus, so Jesus has been speaking. Someone said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. And he said to him, Man, who made me a judge or arbiter over you? And he said to them, take care and be on guard against all covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. 
So Jesus has just been teaching on the Holy Spirit and what it means to live a life, a full, rich life, through the power of the Holy Spirit. And then this man interrupts the teaching of Jesus about what it looks like to depend on the Holy Spirit by asking him to basically speak into a very specific situation regarding money and his life. And he interrupts Jesus and says, teacher, tell my brother to give me what is mine, what what I deserve. And we don't know all the backstory here. Almost certainly what's going on is this man is a younger brother like myself and his older brother was given an inheritance. And in the time, there's all kinds of specific details about how that would go. The oldest sibling is given the inheritance and gets to decide when it's divvied up and how much is given and all of that. But either way, whatever the the circumstance is here, Jesus, as he always does, cuts right to the heart. Okay, this guy interrupts Jesus, I think like many of us, approaching Jesus with the posture of A, in that time as well, wanting to back him into a corner and trip him up and show him why they don't need or we don't need to actually follow him or trust him or submit to him. Or I think in this case, calling on Jesus when it's convenient. When I want you to speak into or do something about this particular situation, I'm going to call on you, Jesus. And that's why Jesus, right, if you notice, Jesus says, who made me judge or arbiter? Well, you might be, if you've been here for a while and you're astute, you might be wondering, wait, I thought Jesus was Lord of all. We use this language a lot. I thought he was the king. I thought he is God. So why is he now trying to get out of that? Again, Jesus is speaking to his heart and saying, you just want me to be like a genie that you call on when you want me to speak into a particular subject. And then when I start to speak into stuff that you didn't invite me into, you're going to turn a deaf ear toward it. You're going to turn the other directs and say, no, 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 speak into this when I ask you to, but don't speak into other areas. And so Jesus is, is acknowledging that his role is not so petty as to just speak into certain things here and there, but he has a bigger view in mind. Again, he's after all of life. He's interested on a macro level, on a big level with the entire world, with the economy and the goings on of the entire world, and also every detail of every one of our lives. Amen? So he's again saying, listen, if you want me to speak into one thing, I'm going to speak into all things. So with that, I just want to again recognize that our tendency is we want God to bless our selfish greed, but that only leads to death and disappointment. And he cares too much. He's going to speak into all of it. So even now, as we continue in the next moments together, I want to ask you to open your ears and to listen to what God is saying to you. What what are your yeah buts? What are the things that God might be pressing on, might be pushing a finger on, might be saying, I want to talk to you about this. I want to talk to you about your life in this way and your tendency like mine, to be like, yeah, but I wanted to explain it away. Where is that in your life? And where might God want to speak into it directly and pointedly this morning? Honey, would you mind bringing me some water? I feel a cough coming on, and this is going to get awkward for everybody. The woman behind the man in every way. Thank you. (coughs) All right. It takes a village. Amen. So I'm getting choked up here talking about money. (laughs) So what does Jesus say in verse 15? (coughs) He says, take care. And be on guard against all covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. So covetousness, if I were to ask any of us to 
to remember or recite the Ten Commandments, this is often the one that gets left out. I guarantee almost everyone in this room would say don't murder, something hopefully most of us don't struggle with too often on a daily basis. Jesus does take it a little deeper and say if you're angry towards someone in your heart, it's as though you committed murder. So we're all on the hook in that regard. But all right, we all say, oh, yeah, don't commit m- murder, this and that. Maybe right there with honor your mother and father. Probably a lot of us forget that one. But it's also we forget covetousness. To not covet, we, we kind of overlook that and we, we think we don't struggle with it. Well, let me share a very simple uh, quote that I read in a commentary this week. It speaks into what covetousness is. At the heart of it, it's greed. Greed is an insatiable desire and lust for more and more. It is all-consuming so that all of life becomes focused on the accumulation of wealth. There is no room for anything else, not even God. Okay, again, many of us would, would say, oh, I don't, I don't struggle with that. I'm not gr- 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 greedy. I would submit, I, I heard it said this way, that if we were asked, and everyone in this room, maybe everyone in the world, how much do you need? The answer would likely be just a little more, <laughs> right? What do you need? Just a little more. I, I was watching, uh, my family and I have watched, um, watched the show Survivor sometimes, and this just came on. Oh, we got some cheers, some hollers. And, um, and uh, what, this guy that comes from a background similar to mine, in some ways was sharing his story and it was about how badly he needed to win and why he needed to win the million dollars more than everyone else. But further on, and and most people I'm sure said, yeah, he deserves it. He needs it so badly. But he's talking about like where he's at now. And I could tell you where he's at now is not where he came from. And if you told him where he's at now, okay, I'm getting really confusing here with these words. If you were to zoom back to his life as a child or his time in juvenile hall or like my family, we were houseless for a while. One, one summer, we didn't have a, have a home. My mom um, cleaned rooms in a hotel uh, with my ex-stepdad so we could kind of have a place to, to stay. Well, if you told me then, hey, one day you're going to own a house, you're going to have a couple cars, you know, you're going to have bikes, you're going to have clothes to choose from. You're going to have a bed, a comfortable bed to sleep on. You're going to have to share it with your brothers. In fact, you're going to get to share it with your wife. And, you know, whatever it is, you could, it'd be like, dude, sign me up. I'm, I've got it. I'm made. But ask me now, maybe not right now because I'm preaching on it, but, you know, <laughs> ask, me, ask me on Christmas Day when my Vin fan broke down. Oh, I need a little more. Oh, why? Why me? Why this? Why, you know? <clears throat> whatever, it's like, I, I, I don't have enough, God, you know, and that's my heart, I'm bearing a little more again, I don't know your story, but my guess is for most of us, just a little more, just a little more. So greed is not just what we think of and what comes to mind, it's a heart level that Jesus is interested in, that, that, that thinks, if, if I just had this, then I would be fully satisfied. Or, I have this, but if it was ever taken away, then I would be devastated. Okay, so there's either a grasping or a clinging. God brings us to a place of revealing that generosity brings richness and life. Greed leads to disappointment and death, but generosity brings richness and life. And so Jesus continues on, read with me in Verse 16, and Jesus told them a parable saying, the land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. It's a humble brag. He's looking around. I've got so much. What do I do with all this stuff I have? And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, 
eat, drink, and be merry. I have so much. What do I do with this? I've got this problem, right? Some of you know me, I, and you look right now, I'm kind of putting myself out there. Um, I'm, I'm an internal sneakerhead. I love shoes. It, you wouldn't know it by just looking at my shoes because I also, for other <laughs> reasons, never pull the trigger on the purchases, right? I've been talking to my friend Torrance for about two years about, right, Nike Air Force Ones or Air Max Ones, what should I do, whatever. And so I never get them, so I'm just left with shoes I get at Ross and whatever else. But I'm internally in my head, I'm a sneakerhead. And in my head's life, I've got a closet that fits all these shoes and they're on display. And it's, you know, where you walk and the lights come on as you walk further down and then the ones behind you go off. That's what in my head my uh, my closet looks like. And oh, I don't have enough. I need to build more. I need, I need more. I need more. So this guy says, oh, I know what I need to do. I need to tear it all down. And, and, and okay, maybe you're not a sneaker head. Again, maybe you're a minimalist. Maybe you've got the, you know, the whole deal, like you've got it figured out. What, it's this idea, this vision, whatever it is. It could be a job, a relationship. Once I get there, I will kick back, put up my feet, and say, eat, drink, and be merry. I, I, I've, I've, I've arrived. Right? If you're not there, and I would say if you are there, again, there's usually a fear that it's not going to last long. I've been there a few times. One story, I'll just say this. I literally remember my sophomore year of high school thinking I've got it. I finally arrived. I was, we were homeless between seventh and eighth grade. Now here I am, a sophomore. My mom has a good job and we're, we're doing well. And I remember I was going on a trip to New Orleans and I was packing and I was like, man, my, my outfits are on point. Like I've got it. Like I almost, it was hard because I was like, which ones am I not going to take? Because like every day is going to be a good day. You know what I mean? When it's like, Okay, I'm not going to have to, you know, I'm not going to just save that outfit for Friday, but even on a Tuesday, I'm going to be on point. Well, no lie, all my clothes got stolen from my car the night before my trip to New Orleans. <laughs> yeah, it's like I am Charlie Brown in so many ways in life. Like right when I'm there, I'm going to kick that field goal and just boom, land on my back. Right? So you're there and you know if you've lived long enough, you have enough gray in your beard or in your hair, right, you know, okay, it's not going to last long. Or you're at that point where it's like, once I get there, once I get fill in the blank, I'll be set. It doesn't last. We say eat, drink, and be merry. Now, let me say, I think this, this guy that Jesus is talking about is on to something, right? Remember that, that, that headstone outside of faith in Jesus this life makes no sense. And that's true. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the author Paul is talking about Jesus raising from the dead. And he says, if Jesus didn't raise from the dead, we should be pitied. We should be made fun of. And some of us, we don't stop. I think all, we don't stop long enough to acknowledge that's just true. Okay, if, if Jesus isn't really alive right now, church is silly. Tithing is silly. Generosity is unwise and foolish. We should eat, drink, and be merry. We don't know what tomorrow's gonna happen. We don't know what the stock market's gonna do. We don't know what someone's gonna do with the money that we lend them or give them, or right? We don't know. There's so much we don't know. Why, why even, why participate in this stuff? We should just live it up, right? Maybe share with our family, with our own, like do this stuff, but like gener generosity, benevolence, that's, that's ridiculous. It's foolish if Jesus isn't alive. But if he is alive, then what he says about everything matters. Again, he doesn't just want to be tapped into to talk about this or that when it's convenient. He says, if I'm going to talk about some of it, I'm going to talk about all of it. And he specifically wants to talk about our relationship with money. Why? 
not because he's greedy, not because he needs our money. He, he can do whatever he wants because he knows where life is found. And he knows the foolishness and the futility in thinking it can be found anywhere else. He knows our propensity to want to have a get out of hell free card to live forever, but to also live right now according to the way we think life should and will be found. He knows that we want our cake and eat it too. And so Jesus says, no, I love you too much to not talk about money. I love you too much to to turn a blind eye to you thinking whether you're wealthy or poor that you can find fulfillment and security in anything other than faith in him and participation in his generous life. So look with me in verse 20. This is how Jesus brings it home, right? This guy said, oh, I know what I'll do. I'll build all these barns, bigger barns, so I can finally store it up and then I can invest and I can be a good steward and I can eat, drink, and be merry. And Jesus says, but God said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you. Uh, That word soul can be translated as wife also. So when that guy said, and my soul said to myself, to my soul, soul, right? He's saying, and, and I finally looked back and took stock of my life and I said, life, this is what's gonna happen. Well, Jesus goes on to say, no, no, no. God said, your life is required of you. Your soul is required of you. The things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Jesus said, eventually, what you think you own, God steps in and says, actually, I own that. Your life, your goods, your finances, your relationships, whatever it is, God, God says, no, you, it was never yours. You, you, it, it, and that's good news. <laughs> okay, that might sound like mean, like God's like, no, like, you know, psych, I, like, I treat, you know, Time's up, time to pay the piper. I, I, I own you. But again, that's good news. In the full picture of, of, of the story of God, of scripture, we're told that God is a, a loving creator. He knows us, he formed us, he breathed life into us. And then when we wandered and turned away and rebelled against him, he pursued us like a, like a, like a valiant lover chasing after his wayward bride. He pursues. And then what does he do when he finds us? Does he shame us? Does he scold us? Does he punish us? No. He actually gives of himself for us. He died on the cross. Generously, extravagantly pouring himself out fully to bring you and me into life, life with him. And then when he says, I give you life, it's because he knows what we need. He knows where life is found. So let me submit to you and to me, as hard as it is to understand, sometimes when it seems like he's withholding, he's actually providing. And when God is providing, It's because he wants us to experience the blessing of participating in his provision, in being generous. In fact, in this story, he says that the best way to fight against greed is through being generous. But by responding to his generosity toward us, he says, be generous. The the best way to fight against the temptation in your heart and the temptation from the world around you that says, gather, 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 hoard, hoard, hoard. He just says it's to give, to give, to give. Now, church, let's be real, right? Yes, we have been the whole time, right? So let's let's continue digging in a bit. All right, let's, uh, not only are we now on your couch, let me take off my shoes, right? My sneakers, my dope sneakers, no. And... (laughs) <laughs> All right, let me, let me put my feet up on your table for a moment. In the church, if you've been around church for a while, we talk a lot about stewardship. 
And that's a good thing. The Bible talks about stewardship. There are places that talk about being wise in Proverbs and Thessalonians. In every place, though, that it does, it talks about doing so in such a way to honor God and to bless others. It says, so to not be greedy, to not be lazy. There's language of stewardship. But I think in our current cultural context, in many ways, we hide behind stewardship. And we turn a blind eye toward generosity. The, the Bible Specifically, Jesus talks way more about radical, extravagant, bold generosity than wise stewardship that could maybe even be mistaken for uh, greed or control. Am I all alone in here this morning? <laughs> Is it, it's, it's uncomfortable. I don't know your current situation. I know mine. I know that God, even this morning, wants to reveal where in my life I've tended to look toward finding security in greed. But I just want to call it stewardship. I want to call it wisdom. I want to call it discernment. And yet God is calling us toward a life with our finances, with our time, with our relationships, with our dinner table. Right with our with our what with our sports watching, he wants to call us into a posture, a lifestyle of hospitality, of generosity. We want God to bless our selfish greed, but church, let's just pull off the band aid and re- recognize greed only leads to disappointment and destruction. But God has so generously given of himself to save us from destruction. Jesus so generously gave his life in order to give you and me life. Yes, eternal life, which begins now. Life, fullness with him. Rich life through participating in his mission. Where he says that the best way to protect against greed is by generously and radically giving of ourselves. Greed leads to disappointment and death. But generosity, God's generosity toward us, and then our response through generous living leads to richness and life. Let's pray together. Lord, I pray for myself for my family. I pray for everyone in this room right now. I don't know every story. I don't know every situation. Lord, I know from experience that greed, which is informed and fueled by fear in so many ways, um, just never leads to fulfillment. But Lord, there is joy, there is blessing in, in participating in your mission, in serving others, in, in, in being generous. We can never outdo you with generosity. Lord, I pray for our church. I pray that on an individual level, individuals, families here, Lord, that as we consider our, our relationship to finances, Lord, I know that um, there are legitimate, real needs in, in, in this room, and you are, you are t- telling some people it would be unwise to, to give right now. But I, I pray, Lord, that even the desire to get out of poverty would be to be in a, a place of being able to participate in generous giving and generous lo- 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 giving. Lord, I know there are others in this room that, that have and that want to help meet needs. Lord, I pray that your people all over this room, all over this city, will, Lord, that you will connect dots, that, that those who have and, and you want to invite into the blessing of giving will be connected with those who are in need. Lord, me, Lord, let your will be done and your kingdom come on earth, in Tucson, at Safford, in redemption, in each of our homes, just as it is in heaven. Have your way, Lord Jesus. Bring your kingdom. Bring the richness of your generous giving.
Lord, let that flow through us and do far more than we can ask or imagine. We trust you. We surrender to you. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen.